give after Christ the King of Shell. Okay, so um, I'm going to be moderating the panel. Um, so the panel will be introducing themselves and then uh, I'll start off with some questions I have and then open it up to the floor, okay? okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Raj Salwan. I'm on the Fremont City Council. And um, basically, I grew up in Fremont. When I, grew, when I was a young kid, there were not many Asian Americans. I was one of the few uh, Indian Americans in my class. Half the people didn't know if I was Native American or East Indian. So whenever the question of Native Americans would come up, they would say, oh, Raj would know. And so a lot of times I had to explain that, look, I'm not that kind of Indian. I'm from South Asia, different kind. Uh, but nevertheless, it persisted until high school. And uh, so Fremont has changed a lot. It's gone from a uh, majority um, Caucasian community to a predominantly Asian American community. And predominantly we have uh, largely Chinese Americans and Indian Americans. And it's continued to grow, it's become a great melting pot and our community is growing and we have a great uh, education, parks, open space. Um, and we have a lot of issues that come with that. When people wanna to come to your community, we also have more traffic. So that's one of the things we'll talk about later. But um, Again, I'm honored to be here, and I appreciate the dialogue and the collaboration and all the great speakers. Um, Pavin, uh, I had the opportunity to listen to him when I was on city council in 2013, and that was uh, very uh, insightful. So I thank everybody for organizing. Good evening, my name is Yan Xiao. I'm right now the president of a Fremont Unified School District. So I was very proud that the last presenter is actually one of the Fremont Unified students. And uh, I was born in China. I didn't come to the United States until I graduated from college. Then uh, after I got uh, my uh, PhD degree from Harvard, I uh, came to the Bay Area and settled down uh, to work uh, in the local biotech biopharmaceutical industry. And uh, it was uh, by chance that as a parent, I got involved in the uh, school uh, affairs. And then um, here I am uh, on the school board. We are so proud that Fremont is um, uh, rated as the happiest city uh, in the United States. And uh, uh, we're also very proud that the Fremont Unified School District is uh, one of the uh, great performing uh, school districts in the Bay Area. My job is to deal with uh, students, uh, to serve the students. So I'm so glad to see so many students in the audience. And uh, I would like to do my best to share my story, to um, share with you how uh, you can uh, get engaged in the local community and uh, how to get into the mainstream. And uh, I would like to thank CLUSA to invite me to be here tonight. Hi, my name is Stacy Shi. I'm district director for assembly member Ash Kalra, so he's assembly member for the 27th District of California. And I actually got started working for him. It'll be 10 years this year, um, eight years on San Jose City Council, where I started just as a council assistant and then eventually became his chief of staff. And then after eight years of city council, when he ran for state assembly, after election in November 2016, he brought me on board to be his district director. Um, I was actually born and raised in San Jose, never left worked for the city of San Jose, went to San Jose State, and then now represent San Jose on the state level. So San Jose really is my home. And one of the things that really made me who I am is really just my parents. They're immigrants from Taiwan, and so they made sure I never left my culture or lost my culture. So I'm one of those students that went to regular school Monday to Friday and then Chinese school every Saturday for 12 years. And so I'm also fluent in Mandarin. Um, but that kind of played a part when I started doing more community service and civic engagement. Um, you really get to connect the, with the community more when you have um, another identity that you could connect with people. So I hope I'm able to utilize my experience to share with you today so that you kind of have a glimpse of um, you know, your potential, and I know someone mentioned this earlier, um, doing what you enjoy, your passion, and making that successful, no matter who tells you if they like it or not. So, thank you. So, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Raj Salwan, so what made you get into civic uh, leadership role? Was there any life uh, moments, experience that you want to share that made you decide that, uh, you know, you want to get into this? 
Well, you know, I never wanted to be a politician. Um, I just wanted to be a professional. By, by profession, I'm a veterinarian. So I own my own small business uh, in a veterinary hospital. And um, so I, I loved animals. I loved, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the best at it. Um, I happened to get into politics by chance. Uh, my father knew the old mayor. His name was Bob Wasserman. And he said, hey, Raj, you're a young guy. We need somebody like you. Why don't you get involved in our Human Relations Commission? And I had no idea what the Human Relations Commission was or what it did or what, you know, I had no idea. But since the mayor asked, I couldn't say no. And when I got on there, I saw all the issues and needs in our community that we don't see every day. You know, we have um, senior issues, homelessness, you know, domestic violence, all kinds of problems that I noticed that were going on in our community. And so when I saw that, I, I kind of got hooked. I said, hey, there's a lot of issues. You know, I, I'm fortunate to be a Fremont and have the great opportunities. And, you know, if I can help and, and serve, that would um, work well. The other thing was that I didn't realize this. The mayor put me on because he thought I was kind of a balanced uh, person. And they had two groups on the Human Relations Commission that were always fighting all the time. And so, and I was like, why are you guys fighting all the time? I don't know what, what's the issue. And I talked to them, and it was just minor ego issues, and I was able to get those worked out. And then a year later, they made me the chairman. They're like, okay. And so then mayor said, hey, you did a good job. You solved that issue. And then he moved me on to planning commission, and then you, know, then you get sucked in from there. So I really enjoy the uh, service aspect of it. Um, I always feel like if I can help someone, if I can do something, I can make a difference. It makes me feel good. And uh, God has given me that opportunity, and I should try to help as many people as I can. Mr. Yang, so how did you get into, what was the moment when you realized that you want to give back to the community and serve the community? Sure. Um, when I came to the United States in 1990, I was a poor graduate student, but I was so thankful to this country because this country gave me a full scholarship to study for a PhD degree in Harvard, and I was uh, studying under a uh, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, in chemistry. So uh, after I graduated, uh, I just wanted to give back to this country. And uh, uh, as an individual, uh, what I did was I just uh, kept dona donating blood. So over 20 years, I donated over 17,000 uh, cc's of blood, about like three times uh, the amount of blood flowing in my body right now. But uh, uh, when I moved to Fremont and became a parent at FUSD, I started to get involved um, in the uh, local organization called the Fremont, Uni uh, Fremont Unified Student Store, FUS. And that's just a, a nonprofit organization to help raise funds for Fremont Unified School District. At that time, uh, uh, I realized that uh, because of the demographic change, uh, there are more and more Asian families moving into Fremont, and uh, uh, the percentage of Asian students uh, uh, kept climbing. Actually, as we are speaking now, it's 65% Asian students uh, in FUFD. Um, so in 2014, I wanted uh, really to um, represent uh, the new immigrants, especially the Asian students on the school board. At that time, uh, there was just no such person to represent this a huge group of uh, parents and students. So uh, just for pure heart to serve, I, I gave it a try and tried to run for the uh, school board member, and I got elected. So, Ms. Stacy, how did you get involved? So I would say I got involved because my, my parents have always been involved in community service. They volunteer a lot with nonprofit organizations, um, mainly with homeless outreach, dealing with at-risk communities, um, environmental cleanup groups, um, as well as helping at-risk youth. And so really I've always been surrounded by community service. Um, but one of the things that not a lot of people really think about, especially Asian Americans, is how legislation could help service the community. Um, a lot of Asian American families are very traditional. You don't really necessarily go into politics. So I would say when I first started working for the city of San Jose, I didn't think that working on policy and legislation could really help make a difference, and it can. You know, I have passions like environmental protection, um, homeless outreach, housing, security, food security issues, you know, these are things that could be changed with policy, whether it's a local level, state level, or federal level. And that's something people don't really necessarily think about. It's great to be part of a nonprofit, which you know, I still help my parents um, doing community service, but you could do that on a legislative level as well. So that's why I got involved. 
Uh, Mr. Salwan, so what are the ways you are getting involved now? What are the, your contributions? How are you contributing now? Um, so I, I guess I contribute most by being a council member on the city of Fremont. Um, so Fremont, we have, uh, I think, 232,000 population and ever increasing. Um, and um, we have a large community and we have a lot of groups. So I get invited to a lot of events. I meet a lot of people and we have a lot of issues. So um, I serve on, you know, I tr I'm a helper. So if somebody has a problem, I try to fix it. So I try to fix things whenever I can. And so some of the big issues we're dealing with is like traffic. You know, traffic is a big issue, not just in Fremont, but in the region housing issues, you know, some people say we don't have enough housing, some say we have too much housing, so there's always that push and pull. Um, schools, you know, we're always trying to work with the school district. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Dr. Shaw and I are on a joint committee for the city council and school board to try to work on uh, issues of common interest. And uh, of course, um, you know, uh, affordable housing, and of course public safety. You know, Fremont is one of the safest large cities in the country, and we want to keep it that way. Um, and prior to this, I, I've done a lot of uh, community service. Like I said, I started in 2004. I've been on the Human Relations Commission. I've been a planning commissioner. I've been in uh, nonprofits like Abode Services where we did homeless issues. I've done um, so much work. I've been chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I've done too, too much maybe, you know, and, and I was a, I'm a Rotarian still, so it never ends. And uh, I get sucked into all of these things. So as I get older, I try to focus just on a few things, and I think if I can be effective in my role now, um, that's what I'm trying to do. And so city council is a great way for me to give back. So what way is uh, through the board, um, you know, or what else are you doing to give back? Um, uh, first of all, as a school board member, you know, we're in charge of 42 schools, uh, 35 students uh, in uh, Fremont Unified School District. There's a lot of students that we serve. And uh, as the board, uh, we not only have to make uh, some board policies uh, to keep uh, the school district running, we also have to balance a bad budget of over $300 million every year. Uh, we also uh, have to um, uh, make sure that uh, the uh, uh, Measure E bond money that uh, actually was raised by uh, the Fremont citizens uh, passing uh, Measure E in 2014 to fix our school facilities. Uh, that's a huge amount of money of uh, over $650 million. Um, the board has to make sure the money is used uh, as uh, the, the school district promised to fix up this uh, campus and keep the students safety. Uh, also, I guess uh, apart from uh, uh, serving on the board, uh, my uh, roles in the uh, community are multifold. I uh, serve uh, um, multiple nonprofit organizations uh, uh, to uh, get involved in the community. For example, actually, Ro both Roche and I are the uh, uh, directors uh, for the Citizens for a Better Community. Uh, that's a, a organization that uh, keeps helping uh, the Asian um, Americans to get engaged in local activities and uh, try to get into uh, the, the uh, civic uh, activities. And uh, I also uh, feel that I have the obligation as one of the pioneers, uh, you know, uh, uh, to really encourage my fellow uh, Chinese uh, American citizens uh, to get active uh, in the community. Uh, when I got elected in 2014, I didn't realize that actually I was uh, the first uh, elected official that has a mainland Chinese background in the whole uh, state of California. So I want to uh, uh, set up an example to encourage other people to join me. Okay. Oh yes, we're also on uh, the uh, board of uh, Apapa East Bay. Uh, and uh, for those who are active, uh, you know, you know what a papa is. Okay. So, a uh, quick question, um, you know, to all of you is, uh, you know, how, what is the main focus for the, the city, um, school, and the district? What are you working on currently that the students can participate and help in your goal? 
So each of you, if you could, uh, you know, speak Let me start. Uh, actually, uh, as a school board member, I have a first-hand experience to see how students can get engaged in local activities. For example, uh, when uh, we were trying to decide whether to uh, repair or replace a swimming pool in one of our high schools, uh, Mission San Jose High, a lot of students came to the board meeting uh, to express their opinions, and eventually, uh, uh, together with the students, the teachers, and the local community members, the board uh, decided to uh, fund uh, the replacement of a brand new swimming pool. Also, uh, let me give you another example. Uh, we have actually a group uh, within the school district called uh, Surf Board E. That's made of all the class presidents of all the grades of all the schools uh, inside uh, the school district. Uh, and uh, the president of that club actually becomes the school board member that sits at the school board meeting uh, every other week to make decisions with the rest of the board on school policies as well as all the other uh, big decisions. Not only that, uh, last year they made a survey throughout the whole district and uh, they wanted to move the uh, finals uh, from after the Christmas to before Christmas. And that was the, the survey result. So the uh, school board member, also the president of Servoy E, went to the uh, teachers union and tried to um, persuade them to uh, collaborate because after all, school schedule is the result of the uh, teachers union and the school district. Guess what? Yeah, he got booed by a lot of uh, teachers because uh, some teachers don't like this idea. But uh, he still, uh, went ahead and, tr and presented his case. I really uh, admired his uh, uh, courage. So there are so many cases where students can really get involved first in their local school decisions as well as uh, school district's decisions. Mm -hmm. So district um, level? Um, so I would say um, just working for the California State Assembly, um, it's apparent that most of our focus is combating what's happening on the federal level. Um, a lot of the things we do are trying to really take back our community and set out an example and be the leader for the rest of the states of the United States for everything that the Trump administration is doing. And not to make it too political, but we, we really need to show that we as a state can't get policy change without our constituents. And I think one of the best examples of the March for Our Lives movement. That was momentous nationwide, nationwide in California, but especially in San Jose. We had a huge March for Our Lives group. And guess what? That was done by people your age, high school students. It wasn't done by adults. And I think that's important to know. A lot of people these days make decisions and vote um, on issues that affect themselves because they're thinking about what they're used to. You know, they don't want change. They want to vote for issues that affect themselves, but it's not about affecting future generations. So you guys are the future generations, and later, or sooner or later, you guys will be able to vote. And so I, a lot of policies that we work on and depend on our youth to work on with us um, are things to combat what's happening federally. So, uh, was the question about what we're doing, uh, working on, or as yeah. far as with youth? Your goal in the city, you know, whatever goals that you're working on, priorities, that kids could become part oh, of okay. it. Uh, well, so in the city, uh, primarily we have like, you know, four main issues. So one is um, traffic. So we have a lot of people cutting through our streets. And we uh, work with ways to decrease traffic by 40%. Uh, we're the first country, uh, first city in the country to do that. And our uh, traffic department has become a model to how to cut down the local cut through traffic, which Fremont has become a part of. Because as you have more people working in the South Bay and West Bay, they're living in the East Bay, and a lot of them are going right through Fremont because we are, we're 680, two, uh, 880, 237, 84, all those things uh, run through. So we're at the crossroads. And um, of course, housing, we're trying to uh, make sure that we have housing near transit so people can. Uh, ride, um, BART, and so forth. Uh, in the city side, we do have um, a youth commission. So our youth commission is a commission that's predominantly uh, picked by fellow students. And so they work on a lot of issues. Uh, we have a sustainability commission where we have a student. We also have a sustainable director 
that works with the kids to go out to the businesses and teach them about how to uh, become greener, save energy, change the bulbs, and do a whole audit. And it's amazing the good work that these kids come up with. I mean, I think, you know, our generation, we're still, we're kind of in between, and we do recycle, but we're not as dedicated as, as these youth are now. And so a lot of times I learn from my kids about uh, different sustainability practices. So I think we're really promoting that. Um, our goal in Fremont is to um, minimize uh, carbon pollution and try to be um, net zero, you know, as soon as possible. So we're way ahead of the rest of the uh, organizations. Uh, we're trying to um, work on an internship program right now to get the kids involved in government and uh, just try to create a, you know, a safe environment for our kids, a place where they can live and be safe and make sure that uh, they're protected from uh, criminals. So just trying to make a better city for everyone. Can I add something? Yeah. Uh, actually, I uh, forgot to mention, in one of our high schools uh, called Irvington High School, uh, in senior year, all the seniors are required to a one-year project. Uh, so in the beginning of the senior year, they have to identify one issue, either local issue or some issue in the Bay Area. Then they have to do some research, uh, including um, in interviewing uh, the local elected officials and uh, uh, all the uh, managers. Then they have to come up with a solution. At the end of the senior year, they have to present their results, their solutions. And uh, year after year, uh, so many projects actually provide many good ideas for the local school district and the local city government to help solve those issues. Okay. Um, so what kind of uh, future do you envision, you know, for your, for your future generations? And uh, if you could add, how realistic is that vision and what challenges do you see in achieving it? 50 uh, years from now, like that. Well, you know, I think the biggest thing, you know, um, being immigrants, I think the main thing that I would like my kids and future generations is to feel like they're true Americans. I mean, just because uh, they look different does not mean that they are any less American than anybody else. So we need to build a community where being American means you're, you're an American citizen. It doesn't mean how you look like or where you come from or what religion you have. So we need to create that environment where our kids are very confident in who they are and uh, not only accepted but celebrated for their uniqueness. And we want to build a community where uh, sustainability is part and fabric of our community, a place where the kids are safe, that they can um, interact, get to meet other folks, and be able to take it to the next level. Um, you know, we're all beneficiaries of all the hard work. You know, like Mother Naji, she's one of the first um, media folks. And 32 years ago, there was no new, uh, Indian uh, newspapers. And so people like me have benefited and stood on their shoulders. We have other community leaders have started community groups. And so I'm able to serve and hopefully my kids can be the next level where they're fully ingrained in the system. Um, I always felt like I was different. You know, I always felt like I had to prove myself. I always had to work harder. I would like to have an environment where our kids don't have those kind of barriers and they can just be themselves, choose to do what they want and, and be in a community that everybody values who they are. So that's what I like So to what is the challenge you see in achieving that vision or um, do you see that definitely happening in 50 years or, or in the near future? <laughs> well, it's definitely a huge challenge. I mean, right now we've taken a huge step backwards. Um, I mean, there's xenophobia, um, there's racism, um, there's uh, code words, code language. Even in Fremont, I sometimes look at these Facebook groups and you'll see, oh, there's too many Asians or too many Middle Easterns or too many foreigners, you know, it's trying to look like Asia. Uh, they can't drive. You know, there's all these stereotypes and uh, uh, these negative comments and un unfortunately I think we've taken a step back but I think you know we have to assert ourselves we are part of the community we have to you know unite we have to exercise our rights and make sure that even within the Asians we don't segregate ourselves we, we are one big block I think we have similar values when it comes to education safety um, quality of life um, and the and the contribution so I think we just need to keep uh, doing what uh, these leaders have been doing like Sandy and CLF and my friend Cece and Henry Yin from uh, Papa. I think we just need to keep talking about it, 
get the young kids involved, let them be the future leaders and carry the banner further. Uh, I think we're all doing, I mean, they've done what they could in their generation. I'm trying to do what I can, but I think we just need to keep that movement, keep it going. And I think when people see that uh, these are you know, true Americans who believe in this country, who benefited from this country and they want to contribute, hopefully with time they'll accept us and celebrate us even more. So that, that's what I see. Thank you. Mr. Yang, what is your vision for the future? Well, my vision uh, for the future, or at least my uh, prediction for the future is hopeful because uh, I would predict that uh, you know, in 50 years, technology will uh, make the society totally different uh, in terms of how we uh, get knowledge, how we get information. It'll be much easier for young generation to get information, to self-teach, and to get the skills. Also, social media will enable them to uh, reach out to people that they don't have to meet face to face. So as long as they have passion, uh, it is much easier for them to get organized uh, through social media, internet, and all the high technology, and then really come up uh, as a group uh, to come up a solution for the society. So uh, it'll be uh, definitely uh, transcending all the local you know, city borders or even the local areas uh, for uh, li uh, like young generation in the Bay Area, they can even go help you know, uh, people somewhere in another continent. So uh, with that, you know, I'm still very hopeful. Um, I would say having a sustainable future. Um, right now, a lot of local officials, city officials, county level, state level, um, we're all planning for the future, you know, having sustainability, sustainable living, um, and it could be transportation, having zero emission, um, increasing the use of public transportation to high density housing and how to build in rather than building out on sprawling acres when we could protect our open spaces. So these are decisions we're making now for the future. Um, a lot of community meetings you go to and a lot of government official meetings you go to, it's all people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, out at these meetings talking about how to plan for the future and I'm not saying they're not, going, they're not going to be there as long as you guys are, but if it's going to affect anyone, it's you guys. And so um, really just building a sustainable world, and it could be you know, just protecting open spaces. Um, our drinking water is a big issue. Our oceans. Um, I know people don't want to say it all the time, but you guys, climate change is real. So how do we build smart? How do we build green? And how do we build a sustainable future for our future generations? So there are lots of challenges in that. So how is uh, the state of California trying to overcome these challenges to achieve this vision? So a lot of people, I think the, one of the main challenges is there's a lot of money in politics, and that's the unfortunate truth. Um, a lot of legislators are trying to push for bills or policy that really make or help protect the environment, the offshore drilling, um, increase the number of affordable housing, or incentives for cleaner vehicles, but there's a lot of pushback from huge industry folks. And these are the lobbyists that have the money up in Sacramento, that have the luck money up in Congress, um, really just to make sure that their businesses aren't jeopardized. So I think that's one of the main challenges we face in California. Okay, so I want to open it up to students who want to ask questions. Anybody wants to ask? A question for Mr. Yang. Uh, you know, Fremont is a minority majority city, you know, large Asian population. And I hear in the school districts, you know, competition is cutthroat. So, what is the school district uh, doing about providing? Uh, a different kind of environment, a more you know, environment that might be more helpful for young people to cope with the pressures that they feel. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, ever since I got uh, onto the board, I realized that actually mental health is a very critical issue within the school district. So. Uh, uh, the board uh, not only tried to engage the parents and try to promote awareness of this issue among the parents, try to introduce uh, seminars and as well as other uh, channels to communicate with the parents uh, and ask them to help support their students. We also uh, 
try to set up fundings to hire more counselors so that uh, those counselors uh, can really help uh, uh, the students deal with any uh, of their emotional um, dis dis difficulties uh, in school. Uh, before um, I got elected, uh, the ratio of uh, students to counselor uh, was way over like 500 to one. Now I believe it's a drop down to 400 to one. In some cases, it's even below that. Um, what is the most important thing you've learned from doing what you do? I learned that it's a team work. Um, when you try to run for office, you have a lot of things you want to do. But when you get elected, you realize that actually everything needs the majority of the board to get approved. So you need to work not only with the other board members, but you also have to really engage uh, the community, the parents, the students. So then you form a team and to just uh, make the school district even better. Okay, uh, this question is for Ms. Xi specifically. Um, so what do you think is the one most important piece of legislation that we need to pass right now in order to better our community? That's a tough one, there's a lot. <laughs> well, how about this? What, what issue are you, do you see as your passion? Um, any sort of issue that you would say is the most important, because I know you talked about how uh, we can use legislation to um, better the lives of Asian Americans, obviously to improve the environment as well as to tackle a number of other issues so just anything that is important to you um well i would say well my passion is is environmental is an environmental protection and we have a lot of legislation happening at the state level um in terms of um you know we we plan banned plastic bags and it was a really hard movement um, we're working on styrofoam yeah. but now it's plastic straws and little things like this people may think well Stop, stop going after consumers. Um, you're just making our lives inconvenient. But in the end, you know, in the long run, you know, when we got rid of plastic bags in the city of San Jose almost 10 years ago, people were complaining and now everyone has reusable bags, everyone, and no one says a thing. It's become a norm, just like using seat belts. And so I think people are afraid of change. It's pushing legislation that really pushes you to want to make a change that we're most proud of. Um, but environmental issues, I think, as a Californian, um, I think that's one of the most important things. Um, I'm sure, like, probably all of you guys have tried to make changes and, like, have received lots of pushback or, like, lots of negative, like, response to it. Um, like, besides trying to negotiate or trying to initiate the public to do something about it, what other ways are there to try to support your claim and to get others behind your claim? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question one more time? I, I didn't get like, the whole gist. Um, how do you, so when you guys try to make changes, I'm assuming sometimes there's a lot of pushback. Right. So how do you make sure that they actually agree with your, like, how do you try to support your claim, kind of? And oh, okay. Well, so, I mean, right now, um, we have a huge pushback, um, especially for housing. Um, and, you know, we all complain about the cost of housing, but then we don't want housing uh, next to us. You know, <laughs> so it's a, it's a complicated problem. Because economics 101 is that it's a supply and demand problem. So if you, if you want lower cost of housing for you folks, um, you need to have more housing. But then nobody wants housing. So that's the biggest challenge we have. Um, and so we try to explain to people, um, you know, one, there's um, state laws that, you know, we have to follow. Uh, primarily because they're trying to uh, reduce the vehicle miles traveled. So the closer you are to where you work, the less you'll drive. Uh, and if you live near transit, you're more likely to use transit. Um, so part of the thing is that the Bay Area is not built very well. And so now we're trying to fix all these things, but nothing talks to each other. You have AC Transit that doesn't connect with VTA, then you got BART, and then you got Caltrain. And so none of that is connected. There should be one system, one transportation agency that solves all of those things. And so um, basically we just try to um, have like work sessions or talk to the community. Sometimes, uh, at least right now, people don't see it. You know, people just see that it, traffic is a problem for them. You know, more housing means more people in their schools. 
So uh, it's, we're losing that fight, frankly. Right now, it's, it's difficult. You know, a couple of years ago, it was very easy. People wanted more jobs. People wanted more uh, revenues. You know, now we have revenues. We have more jobs. We have a lot more restaurants. Um, but people um, are really fighting the housing. And uh, so that's one we're constantly talking about, talking about the need for housing, cost of housing. And that's probably something that young people can take the lead on is because not, people can't afford a two and a half, three million dollar home in Mission San Jose. And so you guys are the ones that are gonna be faced with that crisis because it used to be that if you would buy a home in Cupertino, Cupertino got too expensive, so then people would go to Fremont. Now Fremont is very expensive, now people went to Dublin, San Ramon, Dublin grew by 7,000, the people are up to here with housing, schools and everything. You can't afford to live in Dublin anymore. Now you're going to Brentwood, Manteca, Modesto, but the jobs are all here. So we have to decide, do we um, add more, uh, cut down the jobs, so let's have less jobs here so that you guys you know, don't have a place to work, or do we build um, housing? So for example, in Cupertino, they're building 10,000 new jobs, but they don't have zero housing for that. So where's all those people supposed to live? Are they gonna live in Fremont, Dublin, Modesto, Manteca? So I think that we, we have to explain to them that why we need the housing. The uh, state of California says, and, and you may know uh, better, Stacey, it's three and a half million homes we need to catch up to the supply and demand issue. So, um, so I think we just keep talking to them. We're trying to do some forums and get more discussion going so that people seem to embrace uh, what, the, what the problems we're facing. And second, if we can improve the traffic, if we can make better connections, connect BART, take BART to Silicon Valley, to downtown San Jose, uh, more people will want to use uh, public transit. If we can improve the frequency of the bus service, more people will use the bus. If we can make it safer to bike, you know, more people will bike. And again, if we have housing near transit, more people will be uh, walking uh, in that area. So uh, that's how we're trying to deal with that. So, well, obviously you guys are very knowledgeable people and you guys have been through a lot. So what I wanna know is that, what are some of your biggest regrets? <laughs> well, uh, you have to realize that you know, uh, God is fair. Everyone has 24 hours a day. So in order for us to really spend time to serve the community, to just you know, talk to people, have coffee with people, attend all the meetings, attend all the ceremonies and other local activities, uh, we lose time uh, with our children and uh, family members. For my biggest uh, regret is that you know I, I didn't get to uh, spend uh, a lot of time with my children before they went to college. I always wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be that as a kid. I'm just kidding. Well, I did, but um, I think you have to sometimes realize that you may have a passion, but you have to find a way to make, if you want to make meaningful change, not just temporary change in other people's lives, um, you have to make some sacrifices here and there, um, but in the end, you find that it's worth it. Um, I try. I try not to live with the regret. I, you know, try to do the best I can with what I have at that moment, and I just try to do the best. And if I don't like it, then I try to reposition myself. But definitely, for every success, um, there's some sacrifice. You know, so for everything I've achieved, I had to give up something. So whether it was time, whether it's money, or whether it's resources. Um, Anytime I go to these events or I have to have somebody work on my behalf, I have to pay somebody to be there. Um, so uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, uh, personal costs. You know, a lot of times people are like, oh, these guys are getting money from the developers or you know, they're on somebody's payroll. But frankly, it's pretty much, you pay, get paid very little, maybe $1,500 a month. Uh, you have to go to a lot of events. People expect you to sponsor, donate, um, and you spend a lot of your time. And um, that time you never get back. So. Um, but again, I, I still enjoy what I do. I think I'm you know, living with purpose, I'm making a difference, and as long as I keep doing that, I'll be happy doing what I'm doing. So, um, this question is specifically for uh, Xiao Yan. So um, since we talked about uh, like racism in schools or things like that, um, how does the district deal with um, like teachers or students who ignores the rules or teachers who ignores the bullies happening in their school, like they don't think they can deal with it, 
but then they're not being very responsible for the bad things that are happening in this environment? Well, it's a very good question. Actually, uh, uh, the Fremont Unified School District has a zero tolerance policy uh, uh, for bullying, all kinds of bullying. Uh, not only like, uh, you know, uh, uh, bullying based on racism, uh, also bullying based on anything. Even uh, if you know that in schools, there's uh, something called, uh, uh, you know, uh, academic bullying, like students who believe that they perform better than others, try to make fun of those uh, who don't perform as, as well as them. So uh, the school district has been uh, doing uh, waves of uh, uh, rally to uh, educate the students, um, to promote awareness of all kinds of uh, forms of bullying, uh, and then try to not only educate the students, but also try to uh, provide professional development uh, chances for the teachers to be sensitive to different cultures and different uh, even learning styles so that uh, uh, they not only uh, will themselves pre prevent themselves from uh, bullying or, or you know, uh, hurting the feelings of uh, uh, the uh, minority students, they also can uh, really uh, enforce the no uh, bullying, you know, no tolerance uh, policy uh, on campus. So one last question. Uh, my question is like about leadership. How would you let someone who is like really stubborn to get accept your idea? Uh, somebody stubborn, and what was it? Uh, how would you let them to like accept your idea? Oh, okay. Well, I think the most important thing is uh, egos get in the way. So, um, so I, whenever I'm dealing with a difficult situation, I try to. Um, and this is one of the seven habits from uh, the Seven Habits book by Stephen Covey: is to think with the end in mind. So, if you think this is the outcome I want to have, I want to make sure that one, nobody's egos gets hurt. Never hurt anybody's ego. That it will cost you, and it will uh, affect the ultimate outcome. Um, and you try to uh, look at not what they say, but why they say. So, for example, if somebody's saying something, try to catch the nugget. Okay, you know, he or she is upset because one, he or she's not getting attention, or he, she really believes in this issue. So, if you can uh, repeat, so I understand your concern. Your concern about this. That kind of de-escalates the whole thing, and then the person says, okay, I've been hurt. A lot of people just want to be hurt. And then second, once you've acknowledged it, then you try to see, okay, this is what you want, this is what I want. How can we get there? How can we work together on this? So when people see that you're actually listening and you're trying to collaborate, um, usually that, that will uh, drive them to uh, want to meet you halfway. People, there's a fundamental, people have this feeling of fairness. So they want to be fair. And they believe in reciprocity. If you are nice to them, they will be nice to you in return. But if you are uh, aggressive or you, uh, and then you know, pointing fingers and saying you and this and that, that hurts people's egos. When you hurt the egos, you don't get the good outcomes. So if you can de-escalate, talk about what we're trying to do, how can we work together, how can we fix it, how can we make it better for everyone. And try to not to make it a personal agenda, but more for like either the community or the issue or how can we you know, collaborate. So I think that's what has helped me whenever I try to work on an issue. And I would say, um, especially in public service, one thing to know is you can't please everyone. Um, and being a leader in any area, whether it's business, education, you name it, you can't please everyone. But, and although you can't make someone agree with you 100%, you could get, to ha get them to understand where you're coming from. And I think that's really key. Um, I think one thing we say is don't just hear, listen. Um, understand where they're coming from, but let them also understand where you're coming from. And in the end, may, you may not agree, but at least you have a better knowledge of your background and how you stand on an issue. So one thing, don't beat yourself up if you can't get someone to agree with you, because it's not always gonna happen 100% of the time, but it doesn't make you a bad leader. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate all your uh, advice, and uh, I, I'm sure the kids would have benefited, have some ideas how you guys can go about and become leaders, right? And go okay. vote when you can. <laughs> yes. yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for your time. Um.